Thomas DeBose, who we interviewed before he died, and also signed a sworn affidavit stating that the balloon was a hoax. In your new book, Witness to Roswell, 75th Anniversary Edition, Unmasking the Government's Biggest Cover-Up, you go in-depth on the stories, including the ID of the Boeing engineer who examined the exotic crash wreckage, and deathbed confessions about the little people and what really happened at the Bay Hospital. That particular book, as far as the, uh, the first edition came out in 2007, that the really was that start. And then we revised and updated in 2009. We're talking about the number one selling UFO book in the world for two and a half to three years. And we wrote three new chapters, and we sprinkle in new deathbed testimony, new witnesses throughout, all new photographs, and it's going to come out even more hard hitting. This is from the eyewitness standpoint. And the amazing thing, Cheryl, is that no matter the most highly trained military in the world at that time, or a young child who just happened to be riding on horseback and stumbling upon this debris field and holding this material and then describing it as exotic as these highly trained military. Clearly, their reaction was identical. I have to always emphasize, Cheryl, that I was a total skeptic when Kevin Randall and I made our first trip down to New Mexico in February of 1989. We both were skeptics. We thought we would wrap this up in a single weekend. And after speaking to first ten witnesses who had held the wreckage in their very hands, we couldn't get that down fast enough. It was like, oh my God, what if we're wrong here? We're, we're potentially talking about the biggest story of the millennium. And uh, here we are, we've interviewed over 600 witnesses, and my present partner, Thomas J. Carey, who worked with Kevin and I from the beginning, and Tom and I have been working together now, since 1998, this happens to be the eyewitnesses' opportunity to speak for themselves and describe what happened. What about the possible connection between the nuclear base and now our hot topic of discussion is nukes and UFOs? How could someone be such an expert on identifying exotic materials or nuclear materials and think that that was a weather balloon when they dealt with weather balloons on a frequent basis. The 509 Bond Group was a composite unit back at that time where they selected the best doctors and nurses, the best officers, the best pilots and crewmen because they all had a top security clearance regarding the newly developed atomic bomb. And this was their squadron in charge. And so, the thought that they, of all people, would have misidentified. I think they were George Lloyd himself even made the comment one time. It's the first time and the only time that a weather balloon was misidentified as a flying saucer. And uh, as the late Sam Freeman, he would lament, as he often did with me, and we would attempt to correct and insert some semblance of the truth on the Roswell Wikipedia page. And within 24 hours, it would always be taken down. No matter what Stan and I would insert to at least place our perspective, the eyewitness's point of view into that Wikipedia page, somebody always took it down. Somebody was censoring and has been censoring Roswell, uh, not just back to 1947, but they're still doing it today. What do you consider some of your greatest breakthroughs in all these years of working on the Roswell case? I would say, first of all, Cheryl, the fact that we were the ones who forced, especially working at that time in conjunction with the late Congressman Stephen Schiff of, of New Mexico. He was representing a good number of his own constituents who happened to be witnesses back in 1947. And uh, much to his credit, recognized this for what it really was. And he went public and accused the Air Force of a massive ongoing cover up. And that was all due to the fact that we were providing him with eyewitnesses, we provided him with documentation, and he realized that there was much more to this case than the government was ever 
acknowledging. And so we forced the third explanation, Project Bobo. And then with the growing number of eyewitnesses to bodies recovered regarding the crash, we forced then the wooden crash dummy explanation, which came out just prior to the 50th anniversary. And so how many people within the UFO community can say that they have forced the Pentagon to come out not only with a third, but a fourth explanation for the, the same event. And I think, personally, the fact that we've interviewed over 600 witnesses, either directly or indirectly involved, and sadly, we are getting more and more deathbed testimonies. Deathbeds which are admissible in a court of law, they are accepted as physical evidence. And the fact that we have dozens of such testimonies, confessions, that invariably not only talk about the wreckage, the remains of the craft, but also the bodies, the fact that these were not human bodies. They were short of stature, large disproportionate head, large disproportionate eyes, this slip for a mouth, small orifice for the nose and the ears, and a silver gray jumpsuit covering the ashy gray uh, skin of these beings. And so, again, either all reading from the same script, or they're describing exactly what they witnessed back in 1947. It would be hard to make a case, would it not, John, to say that all of that is a result of some mass psychosis? We'd be talking not only to military personnel, we'd be talking about the media, newspapers, the radio stations, and then those who are on the wire services. Then you'd be talking about all the civilians who were involved, the ranches, the hired hands, their families, their wives, their children. You'd be talking about the Roswell Police Department, the Roswell Sheriff and his deputies who were involved. You'd be talking about the Roswell Fire Department. But here's the point, Phil. I would defy any of these same stalkers, these same debunkers, once again, to demonstrate, to show us a single example of where the military would also enlist civilians who they have no authority over, who they cannot order to perform any duties, that they would enlist civilians to be part of such a stage exercise, such a stage event. You're not going to find it, because we've never found it. He knows his material, Cheryl. He sure does, and I thought it was an excellent point he made about the death bed testimonials being admissible as evidence in the court of law. Yeah, but, absolutely. And, and he also says that non, not one witness has come forward to corroborate the government's story, not one in 75 years. And his relentless investigation into what really happened that night produced hundreds of sworn affidavits from people who actually witnessed the incident including a witness accounts, children involved in the event, many unanswered questions, and the government continued to revise its explanation of what happened in 1947 and today. Not one of those explanations has been verified. With more questions on what happened, why can't the government produce evidence proving its side of the story? Why does the media gloss over various theories that could lead to the truth? And why is historical accuracy of the event being rewritten by the media and the tech giants? And also, what are the, uh, where's the location of the remains of the spacecraft and its crew? We're going to come back with part two with Cheryl Jones and then in our last hour, open lines with Cheryl and me on Coast to Coast AM. Never miss a detail on the show or a guest. Sign up for the Coast Zone email newsletter, available for free at coasttocoastam.com. Okay, that's fine. News on the air. On the 
end and when it breaks. I'm Phil Hewlett from the KFI 24-hour newsroom. Since March 5th, cases of the BA2 Omicron subvariant have doubled in Los Angeles County. It's also now making up a third of the test samples sequenced in labs for coronavirus variants. Investigators confirmed that a body found at the east end of Griffith Park is that of a man who had been missing since March 15th. The man's dog was still by his side, emaciated, but alive. The average price for a gallon of regular gas in L.A. County is down another two cents. It's now 602. Orange County is 598. The iconic forum now has a corporate sponsor. It's called the Kia Forum. A sign with the new name and logo is already on display outside the building. Stop on weather from KFI. A mix of clouds and sun with highs mainly in the low 70s inland, the low 60s at the beaches. Right now it's 58 in Garden Grove, Costa Mesa is 51, West Covina 57, and in downtown Los Angeles is 56 degrees. We lead local from the KFI 24-hour newsroom. I'm Phil Zuma. In Fountain Valley, there is a full freeway closure. 405 southbound from Magnolia to Warner. All lanes are going to be shut down for road work until 5. Norwalk, we have good news. Earlier crash on the 605 northbound that road fence has been cleared from lanes. Your drive is recovering in that area. West Covina, there is a work zone and eastbound from Pacific to Azusa Avenue. Two left lanes are going to be shut down for road work. It's flowing throughout that area. KFI in the sky helps get you there faster. I'm Brian Van. Hey all, it's Gene Sharp. My solar company is Sunlux, and here is yet another reason why. Tesla just released its entire solar ecosystem, and then it went looking for a company that it could trust to get it right. And just like me, Tesla chose Sunlux. Sunlux now has the panel, the patented mounting system, and yes, the Tesla Powerwall battery. It all amounts to the most advanced solar in the industry, and it's all waiting for you at Sunlux.com. That's Sunlux. Dot com. CSLB 100 As a marketer, you want to reach everyone. Adults, teens, millennials. But it's not like these groups all hang out in the same place, right? Actually wrong. They're all right here. Listening to radio commercials just like this one. Radio ads connect with 93% of Americans every week. That's more than Google, more than Facebook, more than TV. In fact, radio reaches 20% more millennials than TV. Want more of the people you want to talk to all in one place? Visit iHeartAdvertising.com and get AMFM working for you. That's iHeartAdvertising.com. If you're replacing your floors or getting new windows, you would never get just one bid. Why would you rely on a single bid when it comes to financing or refinancing your home? HMS Capital is the only lender I know that encourages you to apply with multiple lenders. Because by applying with multiple lenders, you'll end up with a lower interest rate, you'll save money, let them duke it out. You're going to be the winner. HMS Capital is confident they can get you the best deal. And it's no more work to do two or more loan applications than one. It's the same application. And just calling for a rate isn't nearly enough. You have to apply. Apply with HMS Capital and as many other lenders as you want. I've done two mortgages with HMS Capital, so it's easy for me to recommend them. It's free to apply, and there's never an appraisal fee or a credit report fee. Call 833-255-5698. Visit HMSCapital.com. The True Crime Podcast. What happened to Sandy Beal investigates the alarming death of a young woman who dreamed of a career in law enforcement. Journalist Melissa Jelson untangles the mystery at the heart of the investigation, revealing a troubling pattern by officials close to the case. I didn't take any of that because I could tell that they were hiding something. Listen to What Happened to Sandy Beal on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, look, another place, baby. I thought Mr. Fixer fixed that. I thought you did, too. Well, it's just a drop. It's a drop. Oh, it's a drop. Oh, yeah, can you pass the slab loop, Mr. Fixer Lee? Uh, a slab loop? Yeah. You don't want to come up. Yeah, oh, it's seeping out. No slapping. So what do you want to do? Call Repipe Specialist. Like our neighbors said. Okay. Repipe Specialist can repipe our whole house and guarantee no leaks for life. For life? And you pipe can improve our low water pressure. It costs about half the price of a plumber, and they can do it in as little as a day. Well, Mr. Fixer Lee can't do that. Apparently, you can't fix leaks either. Mm. Tired of leaks to low water pressure? Call Repipe Specialist. In one to two days, they can repipe your whole house with new pipe duty and guarantee no leaks for life. Call 213 429 9393 for a free and a lifetime and pay nothing down, no payments or interest for a year. That's 
Can you believe that? 75 years for that crash, though? 
Well, it's not a cold case anymore, that is for sure. When you first heard of the case, what did you think? I, actually, I think that I thought it was possible. I just didn't know. It seemed so unbelievable. It would be hard, in my view, for somebody to make it up, but then again, we had the National Enquirer, and <laughs> there were lots of those kinds of stories for many, many years. But I just didn't know. I didn't know what the truth was. I've got a clip back in Los Angeles to tucked away there in my drawers that, uh, of the newscast that announced that the Army Air Force has, uh, fallen, has picked up a crashed uh, cry, UFO or something like that. It was just unbelievable. That is unbelievable. That's quite a treasure that you have that. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so part two, tell us about it. Okay, it is 75 years later, and the quest for an honest history, and uh, what, what I call historical honesty is still underway, and God seems to be heading the uh, heading the, the force on that. It uh, continues to bring questions to the surface, perhaps even more today than when the incident was first reported. That the U.S. military remembered, George, that they reported at first that it was a flying saucer that crashed on the Earth that night of July in Roswell, and then immediately retracted it claiming the wreckage was a weather balloon, not a spacecraft. And of course, those conflicting reports continued to surface from the government and fueled the misgivings of all of those who were searching for the truth. But as we listen now to my further conversation with John Smith, he gives us insight into why he thinks the government is now allowing a peek into the worst classified files of special forces investigations and why the media continues to run interference with information. He also gives his view on some of the most significant questions. Where is the spacecraft debris and its crew? Who's in possession of it? And maybe even more importantly, what is the end game? Listen now. Don, what work remains ahead regarding Roswell after all these years? And do you think there are any Roswell files that remain sealed? Would you expect to find ever any unredacted or missing files? One of the officers from Roswell told us many years ago that everything was so perfectly encoded that you'd be better off looking at a mess called cookbook for secret messages, secret code numbers and names regarding Roswell, that it became part of the black ops, the black budget very early on, and as a result, it's very so deep that even the Pentagon doesn't know where it presently is located. I just want to read the that whenever Tom Perry and I are asked today, where do you believe the Roswell wreckage is? And we quite flatly say, well, we don't believe the government has it, and we don't believe that the military any longer has it, that everything was assimilated into the private sector. It's one of the reasons that we've had first 10 witnesses at Boeing, at Lockheed, at Patel, at Hughes Aircraft, at Rand Corporation, at General Electric, at Bureau of Standards, Los Alamos. So it was all turned over to them for analysis and the, the potential hope of reverse engineering. And so that's why I say the private corporation, they maintain the secrecy of Roswell to this day. Your foreword to your new book was written by the late great astronaut Edgar Mitchell. I know he was always looking forward to this feature, but how did this come about? To begin with, Mitchell was a native. He resided on a ranch just south of the Roswell region at that time. He was attending high school. And at the time, there was a wonderful rapport between the base, the military, and all the civilians. And it was sad to listen to all these witnesses describe that immediately after the incident and the balloon explanation that there was a total destruction, that it was as though a veil had covered over the base and that uh, neither side trusted one another any longer. And as it was part of that, he made it a point to follow up at each time, even after he went on and attended like MIT, and then he worked as far as in Washington, and he eventually got into the space program. He always made it a point to make inquiries about 1947 and what happened at Roswell. And the wonderful thing was whether I would be with him in Roswell or we would be doing a media event together. And at times we would even be in the same radio station, and we would be on a commercial break, we would be off mic, and he would lean over 
and he goes, Don, did you ever talk to Officer So-and-so? Did you ever talk to General So-and-so? And we were able to exchange notes. And so when it came to just asking after to do the forward, I mean, it looked like I would have been surprised if you wouldn't have asked. So it's pretty much his response. Once again, you're talking about a national hero. You're talking about Apollo 14. You're talking about a man who walked on the moon. And for the very fact that he stood up and said that Roswell happened, that Roswell was a true event, that he had talked to military officers who were involved, who confided to him that it was not a weather balloon device, that it was a genuine article, that we had recovered a craft that came from another planet, and the way they assisted. Especially the American media lampooned him, they ridiculed him, NASA, they just put him out the pasture that he was becoming a senile old man, and I guess that's what happened when you go into space, that it affects your mind and that type of thing, and it was just really, absolutely embarrassing. And Edgar was so, so strong, and his time is always a best place. One of your books was The Children of Blood, which I was honored to write the forward for. Yes, sir, and you did a wonderful job with that. Thank you. Well, thank you. I was honored to be involved in that. So, do you think we are going through a preset phase or preset phases of information releases? Really? We've been all the way from Roswell in 1947 and then fast forward to 2017, the public admission by the Pentagon that there indeed had been a program investigating whatever was going on out there. Fast forward to where we are now, the task force report that was released last year, then we're looking forward to more information being released. It feels like a drip. What do you think? It certainly is a slow drip, but we have to ask why now. It's not as though something significant happened to force their hands. Uh, John Cameron put in Project Blue Book, the most famous of the three official Air Force investigations, named 21 gun camera cases. And nobody paid attention when those files were already classified in 1977. But now a, a lone gun camera film comes out, and just like that, we all are you know, involved with UAP, the new acronym for Unidentified Aerial Phenomena. So they're only acknowledging the phenomena of the last 20 years. And so they're dismissing everything that happened for the 50 years before that. And we can't let them do that. Because if they still keep it contemporary, the fallback remains American technology, potentially Russian or Chinese. But back in the 40s, well, the air was still very virgin at that time. The phenomenon was totally virgin. And the flight characteristics, as far as defining uh, the laws of physics, were still the very nature of the newly arrived flying saucers, the flying discs. So we need to hold our feet to the fire regarding that, that there's a long, rich history they have in their possession, physical evidence. And whether it's Luis Elizondo or Chris Mellon or Gary Nolan, who he claims that he's actually worked on it, and certainly Robert Bigelow of Bigelow Aerospace, the fact that he uh, even has a building there that houses such records. Well, are we talking about Roswell? Are we talking about that they actually have recovered debris, hardware from a crash? And after all these years, as I like to put it, they still can't find the on button. And there's also a major significance to the space program with Goddard. Oh, yes. In fact, the true father of modern rocketry, Robert Goddard, is a native of Roswell, New Mexico. In fact, at the uh, Science Museum there, many of the uh, remnants of his workshop and uh, a lot of the early prototypes of what Goddard was able to accomplish, which led to the Berkeley and then the Gemini and the Apollo program. How would you summarize the accurate and honest history of Roswell, John? How is that different from what many people believe, and what does historical honesty regarding Roswell and all the history of ufology, extraterrestrials, and so on matter? If someone says, what does it matter? You're talking the biggest story of the millennium. How can you not take note? How can you not get excited about that? And the fact that here it is 75 years later and hasn't gone away. People are demanding to know, and they realize they're not going to get the truth from the government. They're certainly not going to get the truth from the media, who has been running interference and are willing accomplices on this stuff since 1947. Don, what do you think would result if everyone, government officials and therefore the media, 
we just tell the truth, like you said, about UFOs and the ET visiting Earth, as Edgar always talked about. What do you think the end game has been and is regarding the historical dishonesty in ufology? It's sad to say that the government, and then again it comes down to who, which elected official, would be selected, who would rise up and actually make such an acknowledgement before the world. And I'm afraid to show that half the people still wouldn't believe it. The media does have a big influence on people, though, and how do you think the media handling and influence regarding UFO reporting is different today from then in Roswell in 1947? Well, let's keep in mind, Cheryl, they started it. They put out that press release on Tuesday, July 8, 1947, claiming they asked to capture the flying saucer. They claim that. We're going to end it. You are the co-founder of the world-famous UFO Museum in Roswell. What's the present status and any new exciting exhibits there? I know you speak throughout the